Good afternoon in the UK and good morning, Colombia. Uh, this is uh, the Performance, Embodiment and the Digital Archive Conference. We are today in our third panel of experts. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, digital methodologies and how uh, academics and how scholars are uh, working with, together with artists and communities to disseminate and to conduct research. Uh, and the use of digital tools to um, engage communities, artists, but also to disseminate uh, research activities. So we have a, a very interesting panel today from scholars coming from the social sciences and humanities too, but also arts and community practitioners. So we want to welcome, uh, first of all, we are Jonelle Walker, uh, doctoral researcher at University of Maryland, Hello, Janelle. And Olga Sorzano, um, research associate at the Royal Holloway University of London. We are in charge of this, of putting together uh, all this conference and website, which has been a challenge of becoming also <laughs> WordPress programmers, which is really difficult. <laughs> so today we're going to talk a little bit about all these challenges, but also the potential of working with these digital tools and how they are benefiting the work of academics, but also artists and communities. So we want to welcome first uh, Sarah Kinton. Um, she's a reader in digital sociology at Oxford Brooker Business School and the chair of the Research Ethics Committee for the university. We have also Maria Mense with us, who is associate professor and course leader of the BA in Media and Communication at K Kingston School of Art, and Manuela Ochoa, who is an artist and PhD student at Concordia University. She is the co-founder of the digital projects Oro Pendola and Mirlo Podcast. So we want to welcome you today. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Okay, so this is going to be a kind of uh, informal and engaging conversation to share a little bit about you and your work with digital tools and communities. So we, we want to first talk about um, you and how you as a scholars start working with digital tools and, and, and to tell us a little bit about of your background and how you came into all this um, in incorporating digital tools in your work. So we can start with Sara maybe and then... Okay, I'll, um, I'll, I'll kick off and feel free everybody to, to join in. Um, so I'm situated in the business school at Oxford Brookes University, um, which means I am probably sitting, although I do a lot of interdisciplinary research, uh, my initial focus was around how small businesses um, were using or beginning to use probably 15 years ago now, we're beginning to use data and databases and the very early aspects of digital tools in order to compete with larger firms. So that's originally where my research first lay. And then I became very interested in how actually uh, what was going on in the world with the advent of digital tools and more importantly, the adoption of digital tools in our everyday lives, how that was impacting both positively and negatively on society. So more broadly, beyond small businesses, so to things like how it might impact uh, citizens voting, uh, community groups getting in touch with their local councils, how individuals were communicating and interacting with each other, um, and within this, I have now increasingly become quite interested in the use of visuals within the communication that digital tools afford us. So things like uh, social media and why now actually there are far more um, videos and photographs shared on social media than any text based information. So that's very broadly how my research journey has almost followed the evolution of um, digital and digital technologies. But I think of digital in terms of both the methods that it might allow us 
So the new tools that it gives researchers to use, but also the site of the research, so the phenomena as well. So if you think about um, using digital tools in our emerging landscape could be something like researching online relationships and how that is impacted through the use of social media. So obviously we neither had online relationships before the advent of digital, nor did we have social media, the vehicle through which to um, have or stop these online relationships. So I look at digital in terms both of as a method and a tool, but also a site of my research, if that makes sense, the phenomena in itself. I work largely um, in conjunction with colleagues both in Italy and Turin University, colleagues in Australia and colleagues here in, in the UK. So that's a little bit about where I come to and how I think of digital. Thank you very much. And Maria would like to continue. Okay. So my, um, I think I started using the digital like um, at the end of the 90s or the middle of the 90s. I was a mixed media artist and, you know, that's when the internet became a place and a medium to create work. And I had finished my MA in history and theory of art, which was research based and uh, student led. And there I was already becoming quite interested in, um, in language and language art and language and technology. And I was looking at, um, visual poetry and, you know, uh, also digital, we, visual poetry and also concrete poetry or sound poetry and how all those elements perhaps were going to be moving with the digital into a different kind of language, you know. So I was already like moving from the MA into uh, thinking about a PhD proposal that in the end I... Um, kind of title from uh, from visual poetry to digital art. Image, sound, text, converging media and the development of new media languages. <laughs> so this is like a little, <laughs> it was a big title <laughs> that it was like summarizing everything that I was interested in. And, um, but also when I finished the MA, because I was an artist and I had been working on uh, performances and installations and sound art and things like that. Then um, I decided to put together like a show reel of all the work I've been doing because I felt that um, the kind of slides that we used to uh, send at that point, if you wanted to take part on a, you know, on anything, you know, on, on uh, you know, an exhibition or a proposal for something, um, I have to send these slides, which was very good if you were doing painting or photography or something. But uh, if you were doing sound or if you were making installations uh, or video, it was just quite difficult. So then I started working on that. In that and while doing that show reel, I learned a lot about different uh, software and technologies and editing and also interactive work. And um, so and practically, I realized that the digital is what it was going to allow me to to bring all my interests together. And uh, and that's what I started. And then I've been teaching digital media for many years. And, you know, and I, yeah, I can talk about something else later on. But anyway, that's my, that's how I started. And this is how I've been using them for my artwork, my electronic literature works, and need poetry. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, Manuela? Uh, well, uh, like Maria, I also have an MA in art history. And during my MA, I was always interested in that very complicated relationship between art and the armed conflict here in Colombia. Um, and I was studying a particular artist called Felisa Burstein at that moment and thinking about that relationship. And when I graduated, I, I thought of a virtual space where it could be possible to make very rare and unusual connections 
amongst artists who work this topic, this particular topic, the, the armed conflict. Uh, and that's how uh, I started working with digital media and um, specifically developing a web page, which um, became a virtual archive called Oropendola. Uh, Oropendola is the name of a bird that is very common here in Latin America and I think around the world, especially here in Colombia. And uh, it, it worked as a metaphor of um, spe specifically the work of, of artists who are also victims of, of this violence. And we, we realized, and I, I say we because then we formed a team of a journalist and another artist that um, it was very common to find the, the artworks of recognized artists such as Doris Salcedo or Oscar Muñoz here in Colombia. But it was very uh, strange to find the works done by artists in the territories that are not in the big cities. So um, that's how we started this research. And we started connecting those works, those visual works, with the works of recognized Colombian artists who were working uh, around this topic. And that was like the first uh, relationship I developed with, with digital media. Uh, when we started, and, and it started growing and growing and evolving and changing this archive. Um, we, we sort of understood the digital also as an excuse to create conversations, offline conversations, not on, online conversations. So um, we created events like film screenings uh, of a particular artist, and then we invited uh, victims and artists, and we started to, to talk amongst each other and create sort of like this new uh, knowledge uh, that was that now is very common to to sort of see professional artists and victims but at that moment it was not that common so it was like a very interesting exercise to make them talk about the same political event or the same sort of violence and see how the visual aspect of it could change and um, that's how we started growing and, and you know exploring the the possibilities of social networks and media and audience. Um, and later on, uh, I developed other projects, which I will talk about later, that sort of deepened this interest in the relationship between art and, and the end conflict. Thank you. Uh, you've all touched on this at points, but uh, our next topic of conversation is taking the genesis of your work with digital tools and thinking more about how they've transformed your work in total. So we were wondering um, how the use of digital methods uh, have transformed your work and also how has your work with digital methods transformed the disciplines that you're working in, on, against, with? Sarah, would you like to start? I'll start. I feel free to, uh, in to interrupt and think of other things. So I'm trying to, I was thinking about this over the weekend and how has using digital methods transformed my work? I think it's given on a very, on a pragmatic and practical basis, it's given me a lot of uh, options of tools to use, both as data collection tools um possibly also as some analytical tools so it's a very practical way to think about it um it's changed maybe how i might frame what might be possible in terms of my research so a lot of my research is actually about um actual behavior rather than reported behavior and digital tools gives us that ability to look at the digital traces of people, of communities, of co-creation things online, and actually look at what is going on and what has gone on, rather than through the filter of somebody else's interpretation of what they remember or what they thought they might have done. So I think in a way, um, using it carefully can be a way of accessing, um, oh, accurate is a difficult word. Let's say um, you, accessing a lot of re actual behavioral lived experience data without various filters on it. Having said that, 
if you're looking at big data sets and scraping, then of course you're at the mercy of the algorithmic intent. Um, and I don't think many of our projects that we're talking about today, that's not the sort of research that we really focus on. But I do think that's something you have to be aware of. So at one hand, you know, I'm getting data that's not filtered. But on the other hand, a lot of digital researchers will be getting highly filtered data based on the algorithms and the commercial intent of the organizations behind them. So I think that's quite an interesting thing to think about in terms of how it's transformed my research. I think it's also made me as a researcher more interdisciplinary. I think as an individual, I, ha I am not necessarily highly, I'm not a technical person. I don't come to this through a computer sciences background. I come through to this through a much more humanities and social sciences. And my interest is in people's interaction with technology in all different forms, rather than starting with the technology. So again, I think that's a, it has helped me to, to understand and develop insights into people and communities, which I otherwise wouldn't have been able to do. And I also think digital has made a huge difference to my use of the visual, enormous difference to the visual. And I've been amazed at how the visual really connects people, whether it's people in businesses or my more recent projects with um, older communities and how important visual is and how that can be curated, co-created um, and edited online through social media. And that's been fascinating. Uh, I was wondering how these digital tools and this digital communication is working within the business school. I'm thinking about, because in the humanities, and as Maria and Manuela are sharing with us, uh, the digital has offered this kind of new uh, or alternative ways to create these artistic projects and expression, no, way, ways to express ourselves. How is that working in the business school? How many scholars are really using digital tools to disseminate research? And how difficult has been for you to incorporate this into your academic discipline and colleagues and recognition? Um, I think it's quite interesting, actually, in terms of, from a business perspective, the early uses of digital were very much what we would call a, a pushing mechanism, a mechanism by which an official body communicated something online to other people out there. Uh, and I think that, that it, they, it was very much more of a one way transmission op opportunity. I think people, even um, researchers and business schools are beginning to understand more that it, there's possibilities and potential for much more uh, of a relationship and of an interaction and there's a potential for user-generated content through digital tools, in um, both in the interactions uh, communities, organizations might have with business schools and universities, but also at an individual research project level as well. So I think uh, there's a better understanding. I also think increasingly there's a lot of... Um, interest and almost rising pressure particularly for young career researchers that um, they are encouraged very strongly to have a social media presence to be active on multiple different platforms um, and that is not an easy thing to do it's not just about the time and it's not just about knowing how to post material but it's thinking about the tone of voice for different platforms. It's thinking about where your contribution is rather than just adding to the, the general hubbub. Yeah. And I think it's something that uh, possibly institu some institutions and some groups need to think a bit more carefully about by saying, oh, well, you, you, you must have a LinkedIn profile. You must have your own blog. You must have your own website. You must have this. It may not be always the best avenue for the dissemination of research. And I think it's really about context and it's really about who are you trying to reach? 
what kind of conversations you want to have rather than just saying, oh, we've got this digital world and you need to be everywhere. Because as individuals, we haven't got the space mentally or the time space to be able to do that. And I think that can be counterproductive because then you feel like you're a failure if you don't have all these presences. Maybe it's about quality and um, thinking about who your audience is and who you wish to communicate with more than quantity in the digital space for, 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 as a, for a researcher and for an academic. Yeah, it might be like an overuse, isn't it, of the digital social um, networks and stuff like that, that perhaps is unnecessary and is putting people um, under the pressure of having to have these profiles everywhere, which yeah. it doesn't mean that um, <laughs> for that reason they are doing better research or anything. Exactly. But, yeah. it, it's not always the people who shout loudest and who yeah. have the biggest presence who are actually doing the interesting work. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, Manuela, Maria, how, how do you find that this, uh, oh. this expectation of social media engagement has impacted your work? I'm curious. I mean, you both, uh, I know Manuela, you work with uh, social media quite a bit. Yeah, it's very interesting how social media works in these sort of projects because um, to have a big presence, as, as Sarah was saying, is not, is not uh, enough. Uh, it's not, um, it doesn't, um, I mean, it's not the proof that your project is working and that is generating interesting conversations, especially because these sort of works um, really need a, like like a space they need time and they need uh, people to really engage and talk uh, so for example a comment on the social media is not a meaningful conversation is not transformative is not uh, and likes are not enough either so uh, for me working with with this sort of digital projects has taught me a lot about audiences how they behave um I think we have this concept maybe because advertising and marketing uh, have taught us that likes are great and that the, the social media presence is very important because they usually translate into money. But for these sort of projects that are not meant to produce money, uh, well, not at that level, uh, maybe to survive, but not like uh, we're not selling products. Uh, we, we really need to study our audiences and we really need to get to know them and create meaningful conversations that are empowering, that are transformative, uh, that really change something in, in the people who are talking. Uh, so it's not just a like or a good reaction. That's how I feel with this, with my project. I don't know if, if you share that. Yeah, I feel, I feel the same. I'm not very interested in using social media just to disseminate the work for the sake of uh, publicity or something like that. It makes me feel uncomfortable. Um, you know, if I'm going to use social media for the purpose of actually developing, a, you know, as Manuela is saying, a meaningful conversation, which is going to generate, um, you know, participants, um, interaction in order to develop some or some kind of knowledge or gather some kind of knowledge from there and uh, participation of some kind then yes but I otherwise I find it quite um, uncomfortable to be like tweeting all the time the same thing <laughs> about your project or something like that um yes I'm I'm not I'm not I don't I don't feel I think that you know the web and um, and some of my works um, have facilitated that kind of um, generating um, user, um, you know, like stories and stuff like that, that is being quite useful to then put together like a kind of archive of, of um, historical information or the memory or, you know, and then... So you can use the digital medium for that purpose and then I'm quite happy with that because it's a way to reach um, audiences that otherwise you wouldn't reach. 
And like, for instance, with one of the projects, projects which is, you know, you see the background here is one of them, <laughs> is from the, the poem that crossed the Atlantic, the Winnipeg. And, uh, and this is like, I was gathering information about, um, you know, all the families that have to flee Spain in the Civil War. And, uh, and it's about the story of the families and, uh, as, uh, you know, traveling from Spain to Chile. And um, it's a personal story. It's actually rooted in uh, one of a personal story that um, it was my grandfather practically had to also, um, you know, run away from Spain. But um, in this case, it's been quite amazing, the sense of community, because I met so many people that now they're almost like part of my family in a way. Um, because our families were in the same situation and the digital is facilitated that. So, you know, in that sense, I am quite interested in, but I'm not interested in otherwise in social media just for the sake of it. Mm. Perhaps we continue exploring more, more of these topics a bit, a little bit deeper. Uh, if you can share uh, some of your work and tell us a little bit more how you have engaged these digital tools uh, with which groups, how, mm -hmm. and what has been that impact or how these digital tools have um, benefiting your research and the communities you work with. So yeah. I don't know, uh, Manuela, if you want to start uh, showing us a little bit of your work and and the multiple ways in which we can use this digital universe. Are you seeing my screen now? Yes. Okay, good. Um, well, I wanted to show you how uh, Oropendola has evolved over time. Um, we started in 2015, and in 2016, this project became part of the Museum of Memory uh, here in Colombia. And uh, it, it sort of worked as the first digital project that the museum had. And that's very important because the museum doesn't exist as a physical building yet. It's, it's under construction. Uh, so this, was, uh, this sort of project allowed the museum to understand their virtual audience and how to create other digital projects that responded to different um, necessities of the museum, but also of different audiences. I am very emphatic in the word audience because I'm learning to understand it. And, and because sometimes, it's, I mean, no, never. It's not enough to just launch a digital project into the world um, and, and just expect people to use it. Uh, you, you really have to understand how they behave, what they need and what they're looking for in the project and why, the reasons uh, why they're consulting and using this, this archive. That's, that's how I think about it. Also, um, well, as, as you see, um, we started to explore different languages, artistic languages. It, it, it has a lot of vis visual art because we, we came from a visual art background and that was our first interest. But then it started to grow and we started to receive works from all over the country and works that were not very interdisciplinary. Uh, we started to receive projects, for example, made by anthropologists who use the artistic language to explore um, an aspect of a community. We started to receive works um, from people, from nurses, for example. And that's actually how I got into Corpografia as the project that I'm now developing along with Olga. And it's um, Beatriz Arias, who's a nurse, contacted me to Oropendola and that's how I met her and then she had the idea of developing her own uh, archive uh, of weaving and memory, just exploring the relationship between mental, mental health, memory, weaving. So all these languages are here and sometimes these categories uh, are not enough to describe them uh, as they're very uh, hard to describe sometimes. They, they mix a lot of languages. Um, and you can and you can find, as I was saying, works done by very renowned, important artists, but also the work of communities, young people, very young people who are working in the territories and who are doing theater, who are doing poetry, who are doing uh, installations, art installations, uh, documentaries, uh, very different projects, and very very interesting 
I encourage you to visit it and with time. Um, you will find uh, you will find photographies, videos, uh, a very short descriptive uh, paragraph, and a context. And it was very important for us to give a context it's to sort of understand why this work was meaningful uh, in that specific community or a, a specific time period, for example, so that people could make like connections uh, from there out. This project started to grow little by little and I started to do a lot of interviews. As part of the research, I was interviewing constantly, but then I started to, to, to tape those interviews and to explore the spaces of creation, for example. And, and it's very interesting how these uh, spaces of creation vary in the territories, in the communities, in, in different cities. Um, and, and so here you will find sort of short videos exploring those the creation spaces. And um, the, the, the most, well, the most recent project and the last one I did, because now I am no longer working for the museum, was a, was a special virtual space to talk about the work of Beatriz Gonzalez. Beatriz Gonzalez is a very renowned and important painter here in Colombia who has worked from the painting language, uh, the relationship between memory, violence, and an image. And what, what really uh, interests me about Beatriz, because Beatriz Gonzalez has a lot of research and papers and books, she's very important, but what really uh, stuck with me when I interviewed her was her storytelling capacities. Uh, and, and that's something that is not uh, usual in the art historical research. Uh, but the, the voice of the artist, the way she tells the stories and how she connects those stories to, to her own life, to her own views, to her own uh, principles. All those things really, really resonated with, with this research. And, and sort of, I, I want to show you very briefly how her work looks. Um, can you see this new screen? Is it showing? Okay. Uh, so we call it uh, Voces de la Memoria, and it was like a, like a digital exhibition of some of her work. She has a lot of works, but we, we chose with her, along her, we, we chose the most relevant ones to understand the history of, of this country. And um, for example, Tumulo Funerario is a sculpture that she made. Tumulo Funerario is una obra inspirada en un asunto personal. Yo tengo un hijo que en ese momento estaba haciendo el, el ejército, la, el año obligatorio, el, y se los llevaron a Nilo a entrenarlos. Fue el primer plan que hicieron, llevaron soldados bachilleres. Y entonces allá, es el primer día vacunaron a los muchachos que no tenían la vacuna de la viruela. Afortunadamente mi hijo sí la tenía. Y al otro día los hicieron madrugar a las cuatro de la mañana para que subieran. Y al otro día... Well, this is just a small fragment of her story, but basically she's telling the story of how his son went to the military. She was, he was forced to, to go to the military and a lot of her companions, of his companions died while doing the military service. And she tells the story in a very, you know, very easy language way, it's not academic, it's not anything, but it gives a lot of information to the artwork. And I was very interested in that, of hearing her stories, and she has a lot of stories. And, uh, and we wanted to explore also this relationship between the visual and the oral through these drawings that you see that appear and disappear. Uh, sort of to to immerse the visitor in, into this uh, drawing that is forming while she talks and is based on her artwork. Um, so, yeah. Um, one, one question. So are those her drawings or is yours drawings yeah. of her story? Yeah, her drawings. The, this, these are drawings that an artist made uh, based on her story while she's talking. Uh, and they end up being these artworks. They're they're based on the artwork. So so it was like a like an artistic exercise to sort of follow this this storytelling and and get immersed into the artwork. Um, so uh, this is sort of like a not like a parallel archive that we did to Oropendola, which explores and deepens uh, the storytelling uh, of Beatriz Gonzalez specifically. Uh, 
So this this made me think a lot about storytelling and, and how artists tell their own stories and what drive them to use art in such harsh and difficult conditions, especially for victims. And that's how the podcast uh, Mirlo was born also. It was like this interest of, of getting to know those, those stories and connect the, the visitors to these very personal, interesting stories. And um, Manuela, I think that that's a really um, um, good way to kind of interrelate the visual, the, the oral story and... Uh, you know, and the, the whole storytelling that you're talking about, it can, the digital is actually making a really good work out of it, isn't it? That uh, engages you in looking at that drawing and you're already through the drawing, you're understanding, in fact, what is going on with the story that she's telling us. It's very nicely integrated. Yes. Uh, before moving to Sarah's example, I want to ask you another question. And before the question, I want to also give a little bit of context um, of the conference and of this specific talk, um, because in Colombia, as you may know, we have suffered a conflict of more than 60 years um, with guerrilla groups, paramilitary groups, um, fighting for the control of the territory, but also power. Uh, so we've been in this kind of uh, conflict or wars for over 60, 60 years. Uh, so this specific project that, Mar that Manuel is sharing with us and also Maria has been involved in working with, with victims of the Colombian conflict as well as Corporafias, our, our project. And is one of the motivations of this conference and this uh, research project is how uh, through arts and through digital archives we can contribute to this uh, um, post-conflict, because in 2016, uh, the Colombian government signed an agreement with the guerrilla FARC to put an end to conflict. So we are supposed to be in this kind of post-conflict situation, looking at Colombia as a conflict site, and how these um, artistic initiatives are really contributing to, to, towards this memory process and reconciliation. So my question to Manuela is how this website and this kind of memory museum, virtual, digital memory museum is contributing to these memory processes, how the website has been received by probably uh, the government and the civil society in Colombia. And to what extent do you think this platform, platform is contributing towards this uh, process of reconciliation maybe of, of, of memories in Colombia? Well, um, for, well, first of all, the, the Museum of Memory uh, is a governmental initiative. So the museum belongs to the government because it was created through a law for victims of the armed conflict. Um, so it was, so the project in itself is sort of like a symbolic reparation because it, it recognizes, it researches, it disseminates the works done by victims all through the territory. So that's, that would be like a, the first uh, measure. It's like it belongs to a symbolic reparation universe, uh, which um, is very hard to describe how symbolic reparation happens or occurs in victims, but it, it has a lot to do with dignity and it has a lot to do with recognition of their own uh, experience of the war. Um, and so in, in, that, in that sense, uh, this virtual archive um, congregates a lot, not all, because it's 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 very hard to to have all the artistic experiences of the country since there are so many, uh, and they're done every day until now. So, but it has like a a big amount of initiatives from very different parts of the country, uh, different groups, and this uh, plural um, characteristic um, sort of uh, adds up to the discussion. Not adds up to the to the symbolic reparation discussion where all their voices are recognized, uh, all their voices are are given the same space. Uh, and, and we try the platform to look very, very beautiful and also like to, to make it a very beautiful space so that they feel it's important and they feel it's important to be there. And that's the first reaction we got from communities when we started um, sharing this, this webpage. Uh, and it was a very, a rewarding 
rewarding thing for them to be there, to be recognized by the, the government, by the Museum of Memory, like the, the, this entity and what it represents for community. So it's like my work is being exhibited at this museum. Even if it's virtual, it's there. It's part of, of the memory of this country and that's why it's important. That was like the first thing we noticed. And um, so it was very well received in communities. We, we I mean, we started to, to understand and to learn more about uh, the digital in, in the territories because uh, Colombia has a very uneven distribution of technology. Uh, um, people in the countryside in, in very far away regions have no access to internet. Um, so it's, it's not, it's not a fair or it's not correct to talk about the democracy in, in the sense. It's not democratic at all. It's, um, technologies are in the big cities um, and usually for very young people. Uh, we, we research and at that moment, for example, the age of, of the internet users in Colombia was 18 to 45 years. So that gave us a very big idea of, of who was using this platform. And the platform was mainly used in Bogota, Medellin and Cali, which are the big cities of Colombia. So we, we also learned that that was our main audience. And even though we wanted to reach very remote regions and have meaningful conversations, um, it was not possible to have it as, an, as a web page. We needed to go there in person. We needed to congregate people in a space. We needed to make sure we had a computer and, we, and then we could have conversations with people. So, that, and that's how it worked for a long time. We, especially when we joined the museum and we have more resources to, to travel and, um, and, and, and that's how it, it really got into the territory, but before that, it was main cities, which is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing either because the conflict is not felt in the big cities as it is felt in the territory. So it was it was also interesting to to see how that behaved with young people in the cities who are not directly affected many times by the violence. Okay. This takes us to the other side of the world, and we usually um, relate conflict with developing worlds, but what about all citizens in Britain, for example, and how these issues of recognition of access to the digital, to the computers, how is that affecting and involving these this, this completely different uh, populations, social groups? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very interesting to listen to Manuela because I was writing down words that sort of um, re overlap and relate to some of my research projects and it was it, this idea about um, connectivity and this idea about feeling recognized feeling recognized and and these uh, contributors uh, of both obviously her projects and my projects um, feeling that they had value and their experiences mattered and their behaviors and, and etc I'll go on to talk about is that they mattered and and they were so pleased to be included and to be part of something else and that something that was positive and maybe for the, the so-called stories to be seen in a, in a different light. So um, it was yeah, really quite, really interesting to, um, to listen to what Manuela was saying. Um, Janelle, would you very kindly try and share, share the screen? So I'm going to just put up, um, or Janelle is going to put up, couple of slides about some of my projects that I've been involved with recently. Um, and my work has been particularly with uh, older people in local communities, both uh, here in the UK and also in uh, Northern Italy. So I'm just going to talk about two projects today just to give some, some ideas possibly to think about. So um, my projects have involved older people and by older people, for the sake of this talk, it's really talking between, about people who are between 60 and 90 years old. And in both my cases, these were people who were still living independently. So they were not in uh, hospitals or nursing homes. They were living either with their families or by themselves. And they were also users of smartphones. 
to a greater or lesser extent. So there was a variety of usage, but they had their own internet connected mobile phone and they used them for various purposes. So the first project I'm going to talk to you about was one um, which was very enlightening, actually, because all researchers, including myself, have some um, assumptions we make about our participants. We make assumptions about all sorts of things, but our participants particularly. Um, and so this project was about the use of social media uh, and photo sharing to mitigate social isolation in older people. So I was very interested to know how older people were using social media and particularly how they were connecting with others and whether this formed part of their individual strategies to keep in touch with people, to form either um, continue to build relationships they already had or to form new relationships uh, or even to reach out to find out things and join groups and stuff to to, to effect manage a potential for loneliness and social isolation. So um, this work involved some uh, research workshops held at the university and also interviews and also what I like to call my digital show and tell. Uh, my digital show and tell was where I asked some of my participants, would they be prepared for us to see, actually see what they do? Um, and I was quite surprised how um, many of my uh, participants, this is very much a qualitative small scale study, um, they were quite keen to be seen to be a source of information and to be seen to be a, a, a kind of quasi expert in something and not being assumed to be incapable or slow or not part of what was going on. So this is really quite interesting. So these photographs show the first project I was involved in, and this is really about the show and tell part. I asked the people to come up and actually talk and walk us through live streaming what they did in terms of communicating and sharing things with other people on social media through their phones. Um, and what we did is we set up a camera and we had a table, as you can see from the image in my lovely elderly gentleman here put his phone down and you could see from bird's eye view exactly what he was doing and that was live streamed back to the other participants all sitting around um, and there was a wonderful series of exchanges about oh that's interesting how do you do that can you edit your photos like that oh you do that do you use that now why don't you use this so what we got was Whilst I was documenting what these older people were actually doing, we actually got peer to peer conversations and peer to peer advice and support between the participants about um, ideas for using their, their phones on social media in different ways, which was not one of our research intentions at all, but it was very um, engaging um, for the participants, but also quite revelatory to us. Um, and that one of the quotes there I have at the bottom is from um, one of our female participants. It's so nice to be asked what I think and what I do. It's like my view matters. It's like being part of a project. Just the actual participating in research actually became almost a social activity because we ran a series of these workshops and people who didn't know each other met and some of them have kept in touch since. And this idea about being included in something and learning from older people, they found um, quite empowering that they had a, a, a voice. Yeah, and so long, they said, we're fed up of being the pin cushions. Researchers are only interested in old people and they want to take blood or see what it takes for us to fall over or whether we've got dementia. They're not really interested, you know, about other things about our lives. <laughs> or they want to sell us life insurance. That was the other thing. So quite interesting, just the nature of the social interaction of research was quite interesting. Obviously, this is pre-COVID, yeah, but nonetheless, 
that aspect I hadn't expected to learn to learn that they the coming together for people who quite often are by themselves or live just with another person the coming together and learning and doing something was helping them in terms of feeling more empowered feeling part of a community a new research community I thought that was um, quite interesting um there's second project so now it's gonna was one in which we looked at thinking about the power and the purpose of memories and how memory might be uh, curated uh, collated and illustrated through photographs and these photographs were both uh, offline hard copy lovely old beautiful black and white photographs of older people's lives and their experiences and also digitalized photographs so photographs possibly that were old photographs that they had put into a digital form themselves or members of their family had helped them with or indeed contemporary photographs which they had um, taken with their phone for example and it was really interesting to see the uh, breadth of types of material they chose to share with us about what brought back memories so there were images of people images of places images of places in other countries that maybe uh, their forebears had come from so we had some um, third second third generation uh, immigrants who are part of our group as it were uh, as well as places that people had visited on holiday that meant something for to them uh, we also had pictures of you know uh, life in the 1940s and 1950s uh, but we also had images of uh, their dog their pets their contemporary issue contemporary images so we have pictures of grandchildren pictures of um, attempts to make or mend or do something in the house that had gone wrong um, so it was very wide what the data that was collected uh, both online and offline but again but again it was really important to give people a sense of um, creativity and curation over their own material uh, and we were surprised again these people were mostly strangers to each other and how much uh, trust they gave to other people in the room and how much trust they uh, gave to us as a group of researchers because these are quite personal in a way they're the documents of their lives um, and some of them were of people who had passed away who meant a lot to them family members um, one lady had uh, lots of photographs of her daughter who had, had died, who predeceased her, even though she, yeah, and uh, she wanted to share that. So this is very interesting about how memories and photographs and images really connected people. They were, yeah, they were between 60 and 90 years old. They had a very different set of life experiences, but they could all communicate and connect with each other through these different types of images. And it was, um, very empowered very empowering it was just incredibly um the level of engagement so we ran a set of three workshops six weeks apart and people would come like an hour early for our workshop so they could see the other people and then at the end we asked our participants to help us curate a public exhibition of the photographs and we had them professionally um, blown up and, and framed and we held it in a university gallery and they brought their families and they came and they put on their best clothes and for many of them it was the first time they'd ever been into a university um, and then we ran the exhibition again because for some people still being in the university was a little intimidating so there's another thing about communities is going to where they think it's comfortable where they are comfortable so we then ran it in a local community centre, which some of our participants used a lot. And we did exactly the same exhibition. We rehung it and did the whole same thing. And, that, and it was just finishing at that point when uh, we went into lockdown in, in England. Um, so I think things like thinking about participants in your digital research, um, I'm amazed how giving these older communities, older participants have been. 
they've kept in touch with each some of them with each other since they've kept in touch with us as the lead researchers since i have emails saying oh sarah what are we going to do next and this i think is part of really slightly awkward responsibility of being somebody who now researches in communities is this implied expectation that you've almost unleashed something um and i keep saying oh well yeah if we get funding we can do another project and then they start coming up with ideas about digital and visual images and what we could do and i keep saying oh yeah this would be wonderful if i can get funding but um it, it's an interesting sort of almost i feel like um, i have a moral responsibility to these groups now which is something possibly which isn't really about digital research but still about researching communities i don't know if anybody else feels that a little bit yeah i've been worried i have contacted so many of these people during lockdown in the uk to find out if they're okay you know what's going on in their lives and and they're they're very pleased to interact so that's where the merging of research and just being an individual in society starts to um yeah it starts to blur those boundaries um so i hope that's given you a little bit of background a little bit of touching on two of my digital projects but i'm very surprised how many people over 80 use whatsapp that challenged my assumption how so many that only young people use but it's and and is the uses that we give are completely different too according to our age probably globally uh, only new globally that the rise in number for registrations in facebook is only coming from people over 55. Yeah. so the young so are leaving the, facebook but the old people older people are actually joining facebook so that's yeah. interesting in itself so the digital is somehow allowing us to reach wide, wider audiences right and to I offer think, a tool for people to disseminate their thoughts their own yeah. and i think for some people particularly when they live they might live so far away from their families uh, yeah. in different countries um or beyond uh, a place that they can travel to and um i know we have a we i have some examples of uh, elderly people who haven't been able to get out who use social media to still try and t stay in touch with what's going on so they take pictures from their bedroom window of say the birds in the garden or you know or person in the street and they'll post it and they you know whilst we understand the limitations of a like or a comment mm. the excitement felt by somebody who is by themselves in an apartment when they get a comment from somebody about something they posted they say it makes me feel like i'm still alive cool so this is really interesting and, and it can take us to maria's presentation and her work on the power of image sound and text and how all these media of communication and re are really opening allowing like different possibilities through digital yeah well let me just go back a little bit because <laughs> it was so long since i feel i contributed um but just to get an idea as well of um you know how the digital tools give that maybe kind of transform uh, my own work i mean the interesting thing about this is that i was already interested in the same ideas you know it's like the digital is being able to actually kind of put them together, you know, and facilitate um, the audience participation, for instance. I was doing performances in the 90s, that it was like, uh, there was one called Speaking in Tanks, there was another one called Life Flag and um, Patchwork in like 1993, uh, where everybody was kind of sewing together this massive flag. Um, so there were already like things about like new languages, or so the crossing of borders, which the digital does, you know, that I was already working on these, um, these kind of uh, performances. Then also interactivity. It's this idea of interactivity. It was, again, an element that has been embedded in my work for many years. And, you know, I had, for instance, as well, well, I was doing even with, uh, when I was doing objects, I had some kinetic work and even a fax machine. I made once a fax machine, 
uh, in meta work and, you know, with this remote control car and stuff. So um, I also use like cameras that were already like uh, grabbing people inside an installation space. And this was in 1992 when I was a student in the States as well. And I was talking in a piece about well, it was the title was $1.99, you know, a way of shopping and consumerism anyway. So, you know, so all these are already elements that are in the digital and I was already interested in. So it was kind of a natural development. Then obviously it's the distribution, this great opportunity to be able to, you know, to communicate and, and uh, again, where we were saying, um, well, exhibiting, but also at the same time using the medium of the internet or, or the digital to create work. Um, and that, that is what I was interested in when I was doing my e-poetry, which I didn't know that at that point that it was going to be called e-poetry. And but through the digital medium, I was able to come in connection with people like uh, Los Pequeños Glacier, John Cayley, Talan Memot, or Giselle B. Goldman, that they were also working on this kind of work. And then there were conferences and stuff like that. And um, and they were also working with language art and technology. So all you know, when you are interested in language, then is again the 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 area of the multilinguistic and the area of the multicultural. And so so you know that was bringing me to that. And then I was working like in a project um, which was called City Escapes. Social Poetics, Public Textualities, and that was, uh, I did it with an HRC grant in Melbourne, and I was working with different communities of different languages, getting phonetic sounds, um, even with an Aboriginal language called Wathawarum, that they were, I probably pronounced it wrong, but anyway, they were actually trying to bring it up to light. So, and you know, again, because you're working on that, then that brings you to the idea of archiving <laughs> and, 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 you know, also displacement and archiving. And, uh, and then I was working with, in a project called Connected Memories, actually, Sarah. Um, and this was with refugees living in London. Again, an interactive piece. And, and that brought me to the Winnipeg, the point that crossed the Atlantic, which all of a sudden I realized this is why I'm so interested in exile, crossing uh, borders, multiculturalism, because, it, you know, it was my grandfather actually going through all this hell. And, and then that's where I also met this other community that I was mentioning earlier, all the Chilean, Spanish, and um, that now they are pretty much part of my family as well. So... In that work, I can just show you briefly, and then I can show you as well the one um, that I've been just uh, working of the invisible voices of women victims of the Colombian conflict, and how I have also used the digital in that in that way. So I'm going to share the screen, and uh, first of all, if you see here. Um, so this is the project about the Winnipeg, and uh, one thing that it has worked quite well, and I think that other researchers were interested in when I've been presenting this work, is on the idea of uh, adding the story. So you can add the story here. So any family from the, you know, any descendant from the Winnipeg, or I mean anybody that wants to. Um, you know, bring up a story about the Winnipeg, they can write it in here, and you can actually access it through this archive. But actually, there is also an interactive world where you can actually dive into the project, and it's a different way to see the stories and how they are interconnected with each other. And it's through this uh, sea of, uh, you know, of stories, and it is multilinguistic. You go in the depth of the ocean and and you know you can have stories in english a way you see or here imagination and this will take you to another story and so this is another way in a way to access stories and to to read them and to be 
part of them, you know, that the digital facilitates. Um, so then if I show you the um, Voces Invisibles, uh, which I was working in, in Bogota, it was only a very intensive week. And uh, this is all the, the group that is, H, is uh, AHRC funded. And this is the whole group that was taking part yeah, in, the, in this project. So we have a local impact coordinator that he was uh, very helpful, obviously, for me when, when I started trying to put the project together because, you know, I'm not from Colombia and also it's not, I wasn't the person that knew the most about this, yeah? Um, so, so anyway, this is a performance, as you can see here, of the women with one of the pieces that they did and uh, it's quite beautiful how you can see like the little pieces here and all the different stories that they have been also working on. Um, so, you know, this is again, is a mixture of analog and digital. And then here in the uh, website, you have the documentation of the different workshops. It is a little bit in Spanish and English. You can see some slides in there, but you know, the, I was working with uh, women from La Ruta Pacifica. Do you know Manuela? I suppose you know, yeah. And then Sosqua as well. And this is very much their work, really. And they, they feel that is their work and that is the most important thing. Um, so, and the methodologies that we were exploring here of co-creation, you know, they were, um, it was, they were with the purpose of actually gathering all the different material to do later on and in, uh, and in, interactive work so you know so you're working but you don't know you i knew what i wanted but still you know you have to be all the time wondering what, what is it going to happen <laughs> you know and whether you're going to be able to develop this uh, you know interactive work whether you're going to be able to get the material that you want actually from these workshops and you are only there a week and that's it you know it's like you cannot go back <laughs> so so, you know, we have also, yes, storytelling and different artistic expressions. I have to think about their abilities and whether they could write or worse or better or what. And, uh, and you know, we were using extens stencils and things like this. But, um, and then the idea that we were also expressing is, you know, to help them to make sense of the violence that they suffer as a result of the armed conflict. And also, as well as discuss whether they felt reflected again, as you know, Manuela was saying in the reconstruction of of the memory presented by the perhaps national and official discourses. And so, if I show you, so this was again like another user-generated process, if you want. And then, um, so we have, for instance, the memoria, memoria personal colectiva. So here is where, you know, they were, we started with this and they were telling different stories through the presentation of uh, different objects. And this was very powerful day and it was the first day, very intensive. And, and then from here, you know, we moved. These were all objects that were very uh, important for them with, uh, and then those stories, we have started to write them in this mural, okay? So, El Mural de la Memoria. And, uh, and there is uh, different kind of, um, um, you know, like you can see through, through the, um, the galleries, um, some of the more close-ups of uh, small sentences and things that they were talking about. Que no se repita nunca más and things like this. So um, the thing then we have like instance narraciones, storytellings. So again here this is uh, again a costurero de la memoria or threading memories as well. Uh, creating and preserving memory, threading your stories, sewing thread as a connection, a way of thinking, a trace of memory. Um, so this representation through textiles to create a landscape of territories. Again, Manuela, you were talking about this. And they, they felt so interconnected because of sh the sharing of their different stories. 
and their, you know, what was going on in their territories at the time, or different, sometimes when they were young or whatever, you know, how they lost everything. And yeah, no, very quite painful to listen to. And uh, for instance, in this one, the body politics, and, and here I thought this sentence of nuestro cuerpo se quedó en hilachitas, our body was left in shreds. I thought that was, uh, you know, I thought I would take that sentence as a starting point, as a significant expression of the violence suffered and felt through the body, and use the sack cloth as a symbol of the body. So then uh, women were invited to investigate different issues of gender, identity, violence, agency, and stamp their ideas and concerns and experiences and feelings and the expectations of this sackcloth, you know, through this process. So they, again, they worked together here. They, they were cutting the cloth. They were um, using the stencils to write their sentences, their feelings. And then they did these kind of performances as well outside the, the, in the street and cover themselves with almost like what it could be like a, a skin, if you want, with all those messages that are embedded in your own body. So, so yeah, so that was uh, another one of the works. And then, um, the, oh, sorry. So then it's like gender, the género, gender as well. And here, this was very beautiful. It was a workshop that was run by Clea Taylor and Aiza Peate. And, uh, and all the women have to, to create their own museum. Okay, so the museum for themselves. And um, again, with topics of representation, gender, memory, and history. And we talk about what museums represented and some of them hadn't really been in a museum. And so, yeah, that was, uh, they really liked this project as well. And you can see some of the images here. Museo Memoria Mujer. Okay. And then we had also audio. And here we were recording significant messages uh, from demonstrations that they were using. And then these are used in the digital art as well. And this was also quite empowering in a way because they have to shout, you know, these sentences. And and uh, so we, we did it, uh, here is some translation in Spanish and English. For life, everything, for death, nothing, justice, my body, the first territory of peace. And my rights are non-negotiable. So anyway, you can see this. Um, and then I, what I did as well out of the stories from the objects that they were talking about themselves, uh, I just took some extras and I put it in here. Okay, so you can also listen to this. I thought it was, so then again, the digital allows you to, you know, to almost talk about the, the same things, but in a different way. So they, they, some people feel more comfortable listening to this, or, you know, some others are going to be reading, some others are going to be using the interactive work, or, or they are just going to be looking at the slides or reading. But there is all these different possibilities and this kind of multi, modality aspect that I have been always interested in even before the digital. And um, then if you here, they can also leave a story, their own story. We did an, app, an application for this, okay? And uh, Claudia Liliana Zuniga and also Rafael Asori, they were with some students from the University of Santiago de Cali and, and they work on this app that the women also work. And then, in the artwork, the Voces Invisibles, Mujeres Víctimas del Conflicto Colombiano, then uh, here is Mujeres de Soscua y Ruta Pacífica, and you can actually access the interactive work. And in here is, you know, you can go to these areas, which is, again, is interactive, but um, you can, I've got all the images, let me see, because I got you. So here there is the sound, and you can have, no, no desplazamiento. No miedo. Resi. Sueños. Ganas de sanar. Restauración. Resi. Sueños. Verdad. La verdad. Verdad. 
Okay, so anyway, you can just, uh, let me just move this. Or for instance, this one, nos escuchan, you can put the sound as well, or you can leave them without sound, it's, you know. And the images here, it's almost like a heart in a way that, you know, boom, boom, you know, it moves. And, So, and then the last one is you go to this one, the stories, and here is like small movie clips, and this is different things that they were talking about as well, and they're in, in Spanish and English. And uh, if you want, you can also, when you're exploring this, you might go to Sanar and Salvar. So when the sound is on, then there is the, the relato, the story about this. So, um, so you know, so this is, uh, this is, yeah, this is another way. I can maybe just stop now if you want. Sharing, stop sharing. Um, you know, there is two different ways. So in one of them, you're gathering the stories through for the Winnipeg and in the other one, you're using the, um, you know, the website as, a, as an archive, but it is more than a, an archive. It's also documenting what was happening in there and uh, it's the interactive work and, and that is, uh, you know, it's the idea of community and how you can actually gather that in the website. Uh, so it's not like just an archive, is it? It's also the people that were participating in there. And, and I think that, you know, in terms as well of, um, for instance, uh, the idea of ethics, you know, as well, like working with, uh, I think that, you know, Sarah, you're probably uh, more capable to talk about this than me, but, um, but you know, this, uh, in this research project, the kind of impact of the work in the participants, it was like the center of the of it all, really. And uh, and then the response of the participants was overwhelming. And you know, to find out how to through the art practice of storytelling and collaborating and the art methods, people share their stories and they can heal and they can get empowered or or get their self esteem and and feel part of their history. Then for a researcher, obviously, it's kind of um, incredibly overwhelming and also kind of satisfying, but also at the same time, very humbling. And so, you know, I think that to be able to touch positively on people through the projects is, is it was the most important part of it. And um, so in, in that way, it has worked out. And now, you know, like Olga was asking as well, we are going, we, because it's, this, this is just finished. So, but we're going to be, you know, the women want to exhibit it, you know, so we're going to be in Tunja and, you know, the different places we're going to be in Cali and the work is going to be exhibited. They're going to have it online and things like this. But so we don't know yet how, you know, the full impact. I know the impact with the women is obviously work. Now we have to spread it. And this is also where the digital allows these kind of facilities to, to spread this kind of work. Um, but yes, it's, it, yeah, that's, that's maybe where I should leave this now. Thank you very much. It has been very interesting to listen to all this amazing um, project. Before concluding the event, I just want to highlight like some points of comments of like conclusion after looking at all these experiences and is how the digital is offering a space to create own stories, a, pa a space for recognition and inclusion to include all these voices or unheard voices in society, which are stories that are not to sell, that are not commercial, but it's to create a dialogue and a constructive dialogue. So it's not about quantity of information, a lot of information, but the quality and to what extent we can really get into this kind of constructive dialogue through all these media and resources. So thank you very much. It has been really, really, really insightful to see all these diverse ways of using the digital.
Um, so now I'll give voice <laughs> to Janelle to conclude this amazing event. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you for all of this insight into your work. It's just so thrilling to see what you're working on in, in different areas, but also in how they intersect in really powerful ways. Um, we want to conclude the conversation by thinking about um, both the present and the future. There's a lot of concern globally about the impact of digital, the digital on society, how it shapes the way we think, how it shapes the way we know. Uh, and so we're wondering to think broadly about the digital, how, what do you find that the digital brings to academic disciplines, but also what it brings to communities and us as individuals, um, particularly looking forward to a future where more and more of our existence will be in the digital? Where should we start? Where should we start with this? It's a very big question, isn't it? Yeah. Um, we, can't, we can't put the genie back into the bottle. So whilst we, we have to really recognise that there are uh, digital inequalities through throughout the globe, and some of those inequalities don't necessarily exist in the places you might expect them to, so even in uh, in dense urban populations, we now have so much contention in uh, digital uh, bandwidth that um, people who were getting uh, decent internet and digital connectivity are now not getting it. So it's not just the people who've uh, maybe traditionally you think of people in rural areas who don't have it, but there are people who did have it and now can't do the things they used to do on it, including, say, for example, um, older people looking up or having virtual doctor's appointments or doing their um, online shopping online, for example. Um, I think, I mean, it's been amazing to hear how powerful these different research projects have been in terms of um, we wouldn't be able to discuss this without digital technologies. We would, this wouldn't exist. Our sharing our knowledge on an interdisciplinary basis wouldn't be possible without digital technologies and tools. So that's amazing. So for researchers, it's an incredible opportunity to learn from others. I mean, I've learned a lot this afternoon from thinking and reflecting on my projects in relation to Manuela's and Maria's. Um, and I think for the participants of our research projects, it seems that it's been very, very powerful, not just because they were digital projects, but because they were so embedded in, in the community and about people and their lived experiences. And we might be able to give uh, succor and um, interest to other people all over the world if they have the access to access some of these projects and the amazing website that you know maria showed us and manuela showed us how much other people could learn in far-flung places of the globe of all different types of people by looking at those types of websites um so i think you know research is it's an amazing opportunity for people well wherever they are whoever they are it's an amazing opportunity but we have to be careful to respect the individual and maybe the autonomy of the individual in terms of how we treat these very precious life stories, the precious images of, of things that matter to them, the precious thoughts that they have about the politics and history of their countries. Um, and we have to remember the humanness in the technology environment in which we are sitting. I mean, that's what this afternoon has made me think about anyway, in terms of moving to the, to the future. Maybe colleagues here would have other ideas. Yeah, well, I wanted to bring up as well the um, education and digital pedagogies, you know, because <laughs> this is where I am completely embedded in at the moment. I don't know about you, but, um, you know, so it's kind of also presenting these kind of new ways, obviously, of uh, reconfiguring and teaching and learning and uh, I think is is kind of quite positive in the sense of um, you know learning and presenting good practice. We can learn so much from each other by having the digital in there because 
you know, again, is this idea of recording. We're recording everything, you know. It's, nothing is completely spontaneous in a way. We are here. Everything is recorded. It's archived. It's, a, you know, a, a different kind of methodology, again, that um, uh, all our actions are archived. We are kind of almost like getting used to it now as well. And that kind of ephemeral aspect of it is disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little bit worried about that. <laughs> and, and you know, again, like alone together, you know, with um, the, um, what was the name? Um, what was the name of this uh, circle, yeah? That was talking about this idea of alone together and connectivity. You know, we are super connected, but at the same time is the isolation and all this. So... Um, so yeah, Sherry Turkle, I wanted to say. It. So it's it's all very relevant. Is the the connectivity has increased, but has the isolation increased as well? And so where is the digital? You know, it has its pros and cons. I suppose like everything else, and it's like I suppose we just have to get the, you know, we have to get the best out of it and try to to be positive with it. <laughs> That's uh, yeah. Yes, um, thank you very much to 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 Sarah and Marie also because I I was very excited to learn about your projects and it makes me think mm. a lot of things, new things for me. Um, I think the digital have allowed us to to build a platforms for people who have a very strong voice, but but usually have limited spaces to to talk and to to reflect on their own experiences. Um, so in a way, it's like new platforms uh, for a lot of communities. Um, also, I have thought that it, it allows us to to have very difficult conversations in 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 creative ways. Um, thinking a lot about Maria's project, also Sarah's. It's it's um, how how to deal with difficult knowledge from the digital, and and I think it allows different pathways that other sort of research uh, don't have and that I think is a big advantage and and lastly I think uh, for for the academia in general now that I'm studying um, how we listen to podcasts <laughs> in my PhD um, I think it's, it's moving us towards new knowledge that we didn't have before um, the digital has um, forced us to, to understand how communities interact uh, with the digital, which, which is different from creating digital communities, because I think uh, communities will always exist. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just how, how they interact with these new technologies and how they relate and how they appropriate these new technologies in their lives. So, so I think that it's very exciting for the future to, to research uh, these sort of new interactions and, and possibilities. Well, thank you very much, everybody. It was such an in interesting conversation. Thanks a lot for your time and for being here. Uh, so we now have some questions from the audience that we would like to answer and include. So thank you very much.